First off, I want to thank the uh, brave men and women who work behind the wall. I want to thank them on a national level because their job goes on How do they try to turn a guard? Well, President, uh, correctional officer, sorry, I apologize. Uh, but correctional officer. Uh... How are you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji, host of Tear Talk. Welcome back to another episode of Tear Talk. Today, we're going to be talking about Charles Gardner's book about the escape from Dannemora. The book is called Dannemora. And I also got our buddy, Gary York, who's going to sit in on this discussion because Gary York, played a bit part in the escape from Dannemora that was on Showtime. So we have a lot to discuss. I want to discuss uh, like a comparison between the movie and the book. I want to get some real details on actually David Sweat and Richard Matt's crime. Um, I want to talk also about just how this relationship started. And that's why I believe Charles Gardner's book is amazing because, I, I, you know, he took a lot of time to do his research. He's going to tell you uh, his background, and I like the perspective that's in his book because his background is our background, and the book kind of has that foundation, something that we can connect to. So when we come back from our sponsor, I'm going to introduce you to Charles Gardner. We're also going to have Gary York reintroduce himself because Gary York is going to give us a Inspector General report because, as I said, you know, there's some some failures here because I believe that this could have been prevented. When we come back from our sponsors, we're going to talk about this great book that's coming on the market called Dan Moore from Charles Gardner. And we're going to explore the differences and we're just going to kind of dive in once again from that Dawshank redemption like escape that shook the nation back in 2015. I stand by for our sponsor. I wanted to attend a university that had an intelligence program. I wanted to look at problems different. I wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities. AMU offered those avenues to expand. Obtaining your degree as an adult, you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself. You can't put a dollar on it, it's priceless. It's something that can never be taken away from you. American Military University. Learn from the leader. All right, guys. So real quick, again, Tier Talk, we're going to be discussing Dana Moore, the book, also do some comparison and just kind of really dive in again to the escape from Dana Moore that happened in 2015. So Charles Gardner is the author of a book that's coming out into the market around the end of February. We'll give you details on how to get that book as uh, towards the end of the show, but we may drop some reminders during the middle of the show as well. And uh, just a little background, Charles. Um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I, I started my career with the New York State Department of Corrections back in uh, 1988. Uh, went through the ranks. Uh, I was a correctional officer for uh, a number of years. Uh, was promoted up to uh, rank of sergeant. Kept that uh, rank for, again, a number of years. Uh, ultimately took the exam, promoted to correctional lieutenant. Um, and then my final uh, promotion was an actual appointment by um, uh, corrections leadership to what was known as a uh, regional training lieutenant, where I uh, was actually one of four regional training lieutenants that worked uh, two hubs in New York State. I worked the Watertown hub as well as the Clinton hub, and I oversaw the training and acted as a liaison between those facilities. There was 13 facilities between those facilities, administrations, and the New York State Department of Corrections Training Academy in Albany, New York. So how many years did you have total on the job? I had a quarter of a century. I had 25 years on the job. All right. And uh, obviously everybody knows Gary York. Gary York is also a author as well. He has two crime books out there as well as a YouTube channel. So Gary, just, just to get my audience, you know, back into who you are, because we all know Gary by now, but Gary, we got to give you that intro, man. So who are you, Gary? Yes, Anthony, thanks a lot for inviting me on the show. Um, I'm Gary York and I have 28 and a half years in uh, Florida corrections. I started out as a correctional officer and then I moved into, uh, pro into probation and parole and I worked felony probation for a while. And from there I was promoted to a senior prison inspector where I uh, conducted civil, criminal and administrative investigations throughout the state of Florida. And I also had an extra detail that I did. Um, I was on the uh, drug interdiction team and we would be called out about once a month for surprise uh, drug interdictions in hopes that we could catch uh, visitors uh, bringing uh, and smuggling drugs into the prison. That's why we did it on the weekend. I know, now, Gary, you also have a YouTube channel, correct? Can we get a little bit of information about the YouTube channel? 
Uh, yes, I have a YouTube channel called Gary York True Prison Stories. And we don't just tell true prison stories. We also talk about prison topics. And uh, we, uh, I try to mix it up a little bit. I'll give a true prison story one week and then a prison topic the next week. Uh, so if you're interested in Florida true prison stories, or they relate very well with what happens in, in, in prisons across the country, uh, tune in. And then I wrote two books based on my uh, uh, investigations for 12 years. Yeah, and by the way, there are two great books. Uh, me and Gary go back many years. He was the third person I ever interviewed when I worked for um, uh, the radio station. So, um, you know, we have a long history together, uh, and it's a great history. We, we truly are. We've become friends, um, not, not just obviously work, but we, we are friends. Um, so, Gary, as we do this interview, by all means, feel free to ask Charles questions as well. Uh, because I would like you to, if you don't mind, after a week, or however you want, you could also put this video on your channel because we'll also give more exposure for uh, Charles' book as well. And yep. uh, what do you call it? I, I actually want to start off first by asking Charles, why did you feel the need to write this book? I mean, it already got national attention. Everybody's jumping in on trying to tell their version of the story. And here comes you, Mr. Gardner, and you want to write your story. Why? Why did you feel compelled to do that? Well, as I watched the uh, media doing their reporting on this particular story, I saw that they were missing the mark. Um, they weren't getting the information out there correctly. Uh, there was a lot of uh, information that was just absolutely poorly reported, uh, and the inaccuracies were crazy. Um, and ironically, the escape unfolded in my backyard. Um, I knew the players. I knew the facility's administration. Uh, I was extremely familiar with the facility. Um, I knew the setting of where the uh, pursuit was taking place. Again, my backyard. And ultimately, the, uh, the story ends in my front yard um, with uh, one, uh, one lad uh, being captured by uh, law enforcement, uh, the other one being shot and killed by uh, federal authorities. But you know, you know what's great, man, is is that you you mentioned that this hit home, you know, because obviously it was in your backyard. You worked with some of these individuals, but when you heard about this escape from New York, when you heard about the escape from Clinton, what didn't it shock you? Because Clinton had a history of being a facility that you couldn't escape from. Correct. Understand, Clinton Correctional is uh, 170 years old at the time of the escape. Yes, there had been a number of escapes from Clinton Correctional, but basically there hadn't been an escape from Clinton Correctional in about a century, in about a hundred years. Um, Clinton a, was a very, is, still is a very well-run correctional facility, um, and it wasn't, uh, it was never in the headlines until this escape. Then all of a sudden there was all sorts of issues as far as the press and the public was concerned uh, with this facility. And unfortunately, that wasn't the case as far as I was concerned. Right. And now, uh, now obviously, how long were you out of corrections by 2015? I had been out of corrections for uh, basically just shy of two years. Right. And when this escape happened, did you know right off the bat that this was going to be national? Um, the first couple of days, no. But probably within, within that day two, day three, when they started rolling in with uh, the equipment and the trucks, yeah, there was no doubt in anybody's mind that this was going to uh, this was going to draw some attention without a doubt. And and just to show you how how widespread the story was, Gary, you're out in Florida, correct? And you heard about this story, huh? Oh, out here in Florida, every day it was on the news. There wasn't a day it was not on the news. Uh, Florida news channels across the state were covering that story. So let me ask you both a question here. I'll start with Charles and I'll ask Gary. But when you hear a story like this, and both you guys have different foundations, right? You moved yourself up into training, administrative level, Charles. Gary had 12 years in, in, um, as an inspector. How did that affect your perspective in regards to how you thought the escape could have happened? Did you guys think differently because your foundation is one of an officer straight up to lieutenant? So maybe you're focused on the security side of things and maybe Gary's looking at maybe failed policies or something administratively. 
Like what, what, when, when they said that escape happened, what was the first thing that went through your mind as to what caused it? Anthony, when I first heard about the escape, the first thing that went through my mind was the fact that I had watched for the last 25 years, New York State continue to cut staff and add more job duties to the officers, the officers that were on the front lines. And um, the first thing that went through my mind was the concept that New York State has had for probably two decades was do more with less. And, and the officers in New York State correctional systems, those guys are working their eight hour, 15 minute shift with no breaks, no lunch hour, and a tremendous amount of workload. Um, and w without a doubt, there's gonna be a failure when you continue to do that day in and day out. There, there's gonna be some corners that are gonna be cut or there's gonna be some things that um, aren't being looked at um, appropriately because there's just so many hours in the day and you just can't do it. Um, th there's just too much workload for the staff that they've got working in these facilities. Something else that New York State had done years ago was they changed the uh, staffing levels and you've got basically one officer watching 60 inmates in, uh, in these housing units, housing units that were designed for, for 50 inmates. Mm. Then you had maximum security prisons that were designed for uh, one man per cell and all of a sudden you've got two men per cell. Um, you, you, just, you just keep on cramming people into these facilities but you don't increase the staff levels and there's gonna be a failure there was a failure. The pathetic and frightening thing is there's going to be another failure. It's a matter of when and where. And, and the thing is, obviously, from your perspective, I agree 100 percent because I read about the concerns that are happening in New York, especially after the inspector general report. And they definitely made note of the operational concerns, including the understaffing, obviously, which was a main part in uh, any type of security concern, not even just the escape. And, and Gary, from your, your, you know, your eyes, you got the inspector general background, been there for 12 years. You're reading that report and you're scratching your head. Why are you scratching your head? Well, there's a couple of issues. First of all, I want to tell you, Charles, that uh, uh, Anthony and I have both done articles and videos on the effects of staff shortages. So I agree with you, too, that the staff shortage is a big issue. Now, because of my background, you know, and my suspicious uh, uh, things that I think about when I see this, I have to be honest, I'm gonna tell you, when I first heard the story, I looked at my wife, and I, who was a retired with 35 years in corrections, and I told her, I said, there's help. And I told her, unfortunately, uh, you know, it's a staff member. Now, I didn't know if it was gonna be a civilian staff member when it all was finished, or a uniformed officer, but I knew there was some type of help. And um, I don't know how far you want me to get into it. I do know, there was a couple of allegations of inappropriate relationship provided to the inspector generals in New York about this incident. And um, I don't know if you want me to give my take on that yet, on how that was handled in my well, opinion. Let, let's do this, I agree 100%. Why don't we do this? Um, because that's when it'll be great for you also to dive in because when, when Charles, uh, by the way, his book is amazing, Gary. I'll, I'll send it up your way. Uh, well, I don't have the, yeah, it's called Dan and Moore. I was able to get it a lot earlier, uh, so I was able to read it prior to the release. Uh, but I'm, I'm done with it, so I'm sure Charles won't mind if I send you the book. Um, I, I enjoyed it, guys. If you have a chance, you got to read it. Again, I'm giving another plug for the book, but I wouldn't be plugging the book if I felt it you know, wasn't a good book. This book is very good. It, 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 even though you know what happened, it still keeps you interested because it explains everything in detail. And you can tell Charles wrote it. He did his research on every possible level. And I, and I want to get to that because I do want to compare what we saw on Showtime compared to what your book has to offer. But why don't we do this? Why don't we start talking about the, the characters that are involved? Let's talk about – I got four main characters I want to discuss, do a little background on them. And then we'll talk about these interactions in the facility – and then maybe when we start talking about that, we'll talk about where we feel the failures were and what could have been prevented. Because that's the key here, guys. Even when I did my rounds on, on the television channels, the concern was, was we're looking at a situation that could have been prevented. So it becomes more frustrated because, to me, it was another slap to the system. And, of course, me always defending the system, uh, it gets frustrated because you can't defend it. Uh, that's the concern. You, you can't defend it. And at one point, you just got to put your hands up and say, hey, I, there's nothing I can say here. What can I say? And it's, and it's frustrating. 
Um, but but the four characters I wanted to explore a little bit and tell me if I'm missing any was obviously going to be going to be um, David Sweat, Richard Matt, of course Joyce Mitchell, and I wanted to explore also Eugene Palmer. Um, so um, let's talk first about. David Sweat, let's talk about what brought him into prison because there's a little controversy right now with that too because he's going after Ben Stiller right now. He's saying that Ben Stiller got this all wrong, especially his crime, and it's going to be hard for him to get a lawyer to take his case. When, um, let, let, what happened that night with uh, David Sweat? You know, what, what happened with the officer that he uh, um, was accused of murdering? Like, what is it that he's saying – um, ben Stiller got wrong, and you actually read the case. You know specifically what happened. So let's hear it. Okay, so with regards to David Sweat, we went into the history of David Sweat, and we went into uh, his childhood. Um, he came from, a, unfortunately, a dysfunctional home where partying was priority number one. Uh, this was uh, an environment that this kid grew up in. Um, mom uh, sent him down to Florida to live with family. He wasn't down in Florida very long, and he was uh, sent back north, uh, returned to sender after he had uh, wrecked a uh, family member's uh, car down in Florida. As he grew up a little bit more, uh, he went through the PIMS program, and then uh, he actually ended up um, a bleep on the radar with uh, law enforcement. He had a couple of scrapes with law enforcement, uh, got hooked up with his cousin. Uh, his cousin's name, uh, Jeffrey, uh, I'm going to say it's uh, Nabinger, N-A-B-I-N-G-E-R, Jeffrey Nabinger. Um, they became uh, these two guys that were burglarizing different homes. Um, as he got into his early 20s in Kirkwood, New York, there was an incident involving this kid um, that it was brought to David Sweat's attention. The kid's name was Fisher. Long story short, this Fisher had an encounter with law enforcement um, resulting in gunfire. The Fisher kid was killed by law enforcement. From that point forward, David Sweat vowed that if he was ever committing a crime, if he was ever approached by law enforcement, that he was going to react the same way that he was not going to go down without a fight. Fast forward to um, July 4th, 2002, David Sweat, his cousin, Jeffrey Nabinger, and a co-defendant by the name of Sean Duval, went into Pennsylvania, Great Bend, Pennsylvania, went to Messes Fireworks. They burglarized Messes Fireworks with a stolen pickup truck. Um, removed handguns, knives from that establishment in the early hours of, again, July 4th, 2002, proceeded back into New York State, approximately 15 minutes from the uh, burglary site, to a little park in Kirkwood, New York, where they were transferring the stolen goods from the stolen pickup truck into Sweat's personal vehicle. During the time that they were transferring his own goods, a Broome County Sheriff's Department patrol came upon them. A deputy by the name of Kevin Tarcia uh, pulled into the parking lot, approached the vehicles. As the deputy stood in front of his cruiser, David Sweat, true to his word, came out of cover with an AR-styled weapon in one hand and a Glock 40 caliber in another, and pelted that deputy sheriff with 15 rounds. Some of those rounds missed their target. A number of rounds bounced off the deputy's vest. One round snuck up underneath the vest, hitting Tarsia in the belly and doing damage, knocking Tarsia to the ground. Deputy Tarsia, continuing to try to engage, was then struck by David Sweat's souped-up souped Honda Accord um, was struck by the vehicle, was trapped underneath the vehicle, was dragged across this asphalt parking lot until he finally came out from underneath the vehicle with all sorts of injuries. The deputy was still fighting. 
At this point in time, co-defendant Jeffrey Nabinger came out of hiding, shot one round from his stolen handgun, and in the process, the clip came out of the weapon. So then he picked up Deputy Tarcia's service revolver. And when you read the case file, it's not clear if Sweat told him to shoot him or if he shot him on his own. But long story short, the deputy was assassinated with two rounds to the head. And that was a point of contingent um, with regards to the, uh, the actual trial. Um, long story short, however, uh, Duval actually took a plea and he, he uh, was actually a, a witness on behalf of the state. He gave a ton of evidence, uh, damning evidence against both uh, Jeffrey as well as uh, um, David Sweat. Um, but Sweat took a plea to murder first and then the following day, uh, Navinger took uh, the same plea. Uh, so Navinger admitted to doing the the execution, the, the assassination? They, they, they both pled to the same charge, which was murder in the first degree. Uh, Sweat took the first um, plea. The following day, Navinger took the uh, the same deal. All right, now, now moving forward, um, let's get um, Richard Matt. What, what's his story? Anthony, Richard Matt's history is unbelievably lengthy, and I'll, I'll try to walk us through it. By the time that he was six months of age, he would be found abandoned in the uh, family vehicle. Thus, um, he'd be um, picked up and protected by Child Protective Services. He'd find himself in multiple foster homes as, as a child. By the time he rolled around into the eighth grade, he had quit school. In 1980, at the age of 14 years of age, he would be found attempting to steal a houseboat. That would result in him ending up in a secure facility run by the New York State Department of uh, Division of Youth Services. While incarcerated in that secured facility, Richard Matt would be credited with his first documented escape. He would steal a horse at that facility, and he would ride to freedom. He would find himself in the Allegheny State Park, which is Western New York's playground, uh, filled with camps. It's, it's basically set up just like the Adirondack Park, where it, it would be basically running parallel. The first escape would run parallel with his last escape. He would uh, pillage from those assorted camps, taking what he needed to survive from food and clothing items. At 14 years of age, this would be, again, his documented first escape. Within a couple of years, in 1983, at 17 years of age, he'd be charged with first-degree robbery. He would plead to a lesser charge. He would plead to third-degree robbery. He, ultimately, he'd be sentenced to five years, terms and conditions of probation. Within a couple of years, at 19 years of age, in 1985, he'd violate the terms and conditions of his probation. He had been charged with second degree uh, criminal possession of a forged instrument. He'd be found in possession of a vehicle that he had purchased utilizing forged checks, thus violating his terms and conditions of probation. At 19 years of age, Richard Matt would find himself sitting in the Erie County Jail. He'd be waiting for his day in court. He wouldn't wait very long. By June 15th of 1986, he would escape from the Erie County Jail. He'd be on the run for approximately a week before he'd be found, located, and rearrested at his brother's home. In 1986, he'd be sentenced, going back to the original charge of the criminal possession and the violation of the terms and conditions, um, and he'd be ultimately sentenced to one and a quarter to four years with the New York State Department of Corrections. This would be his first state bid. He wouldn't be sentenced for the escape uh, until about a year later, at which time um, he'd be sentenced again to a one and a quarter to four to run concurrent with his, uh, his current bid with the New York State Department of Corrections. In February of 1988, he was released at 21 years of age. This early release resulted in him burglarizing a home, 
assaulting and raping the woman who lived there. He would be returned to the New York State prison system in 1990 to finish his first bid. He wouldn't answer to the burglary charges and the assault and the uh, rape charges, those allegations he wouldn't answer to until 1991. In 1991, while awaiting to answer those charges, he'd be incarcerated in again the county jail. There'd be a $15,000 bail holding him in place. While incarcerated in the uh, Erie County Jail, he would have a chance encounter with David Telstar. David Telstar, this individual, was a uh, fugitive from justice that had been detained by authorities while he was attempting to re-enter the United States. David Telstar was originally from California. While incarcerated in the county jail, waiting to go back to California, him and Richard Matt had all of a sudden formed some sort of a bond. Matt was, was capable of seeing that Telstar was uh, in definite need of uh, someone that had uh, some definite jail smarts. The uh, David Telstar, the pretty boy from California, was married to a lady by the name of Desiree Telstar. Desiree was the granddaughter to movie mogul Henry Warner, Warner Brothers Television. David Telstar and Richard Matt ended up conspiring to kill Desiree Telstar. Desiree's mother, who's Betty Warner, uh, her last name was uh, Sheabom, I believe is how you pronounce it. Her husband was Stanley Sheabom. Stanley Sheabom was the L.A. police commissioner, president. As well as they had conspired to kill the, uh, the attorney, Walter Valentine, who had put together this trust. Uh, it was a just shy of $2 million trust that David Telstar had allegedly um, uh, taken and run uh, over to uh, Europe to, uh, to hide the money. And uh, to avoid having to go through trial, David Telstar, it appears that his, uh, his theory was, get rid of the four people that are making my life miserable. Richard Matt was, uh, was on board. Uh, he just had to have somebody that could come up with the $15,000 to uh, get him out of county jail. David Telstar was that guy. They had conspired, as you read through the, the book, that uh, for $100,000, Richard Matt would make those four people go away and thus uh, kill them as well as burn the bodies. Once David Telstar had posted Richard Matt's bail, Richard Matt went right to the authorities and went to work for the FBI. Long story short, you'll find that in Denomora. Moving forward to the year 1993, Richard Matt, as a result of his cooperation with the uh, federal authorities, would ultimately plead to attempted burglary on the uh, assault, rape, and burglary charge. He'd uh, plead it down, and he would enter the uh, New York State Department of Corrections um, for his second bid. In 1996, he'd be paroled, um, and he would return back to the streets after just a few years. Wouldn't take him long, and again, he would violate the terms and conditions of probation um, and uh, parole, excuse me, and he would be returned back into the, uh, the system. He would end up finishing up his sentence. Um, he'd catch himself a couple of other little charges, DWIs, simple stuff. But um, basically, when he finished up his second bid, he went to work for a gentleman by the name of William Rickerson, 76-year-old William Rickerson. Rickerson was willing to give uh, this two-time felon a, a chance. Rickerson owned a, uh, like a food processing business type of a scenario. Richard Matt had decided that he wanted to get into the food processing business as well. And ultimately, Richard Matt would start stealing product from William Rickerson. Wouldn't take long, William Rickerson got wind of it, and he cut bait with Richard Matt. In uh, December 3rd of 1997, Richard Matt would conspire with a kid by the name of Lee Bates. And they would go to William Rickerson's home, and they would assault him. They would kidnap him, and they would take him for a 27-hour ride through New York State, through Pennsylvania, and Ohio, 
and then returned back through, ultimately ending up in uh, New York State again. After 27 hours of unbelievable beatings, torture, uh, Richard Matt had this thought in his head that William Rickerson owed him all sorts of money. He had this thought in his head that William Rickerson had all sorts of money hidden somewhere. Um, ultimately, Richard Matt and his co-defendant, Lee Bates, ended up with about $80 cash, a couple of credit cards, and a ring that was um, Mr. Rickerson's wife's ring. Richard Matt would ultimately snap Mr. Rickerson's neck dump the body along the Niagara River, and ultimately come back a few days later, dismember the body with a hacksaw, that's where he got his nickname from, throw the body parts into the Niagara River. Law enforcement would investigate. Eventually, they would go to Lee Bates, and Lee Bates would finally fold like a cheap lawn chair and look for protection from law enforcement, thus sending Richard Matt on his run towards Mexico. Richard Matt would assume his stepbrother's ID, would take his stepbrother's vehicle, and he would run to Mexico. Shortly after arriving in Mexico, Richard Matt had a chance encounter with a businessman from the United States by the name of Charles Peralt at a bar. He had seen that Peralt had some cash in his hand. Uh, long story short, he would follow Mr. Peralt into the uh, men's room where he would stab him repeatedly till he, he had died. Richard Matt would be caught by Mexican authorities. Long story short, he'd be sentenced to 23 years in prison. After only serving approximately nine years in the Mexican prison, and during the time that he was serving approximately nine years in the Mexican prison, Richard Matt would attempt to escape again. He would breach his cell he would be found rooftop inside the Mexican prison, and he'd be shot by guards. He'd be returned to that prison. But in 2007, after about nine years of being incarcerated in the Mexican prison, Richard Matt would find himself on an airplane and ultimately find himself in Niagara County waiting trial on the Rickerson murder. While in the custody of the Niagara County Jail in the Sheriff's Department of Niagara County, a fourth plot to escape was exposed. A tremendous effort was made by the Niagara County Sheriff's Department to keep this man who had three documented escapes, two successful uh, escapes, in their custody while this trial took place. We discussed in Denimora a number of the security procedures that were put in place, um, and, and it just it's unbelievable what this sheriff's department had to go through to make sure that they maintained custody and control of this individual. Shortly after conviction, before the ink was dry, in 2008, Richard Matt, as soon as the verdict had come in of guilty, the uh, Niagara County Sheriff's Department couldn't get rid of this man fast enough. Within a few weeks, Richard Matt would find himself at Clinton Correctional Facility. And yet he still finds himself on this honor block. Yeah. In Clinton. It's, so we got two more characters real quick. I say characters, but two more people I want to just explore a little bit. And then we're going to get into the interaction that we're going to have with everyone here. Uh, but we also have Eugene Palmer. And I know my stomach curdles a little bit when I say him. I know Gary, uh, you can see a little face from Gary here. We're not obviously big fans of Eugene Palmer, but you have a little story on this guy? Um. Eugene Palmer, for, for the most part, he had a pretty much unblemished correctional career. It wasn't until towards the end of his career that he kind of came off the rails a little bit, uh, had some time on the job, was going to kind of do things his way, and that way kind of came up and bit him in the ass. I mean, that's the bottom line. And just um, so people are aware, Eugene Palmer, what's his relationship in all this? Um, he was, for the last eight years of his career in corrections, he was the escort officer from the honor block to the tailor shops. So he would be the regular face Monday through Fridays, moving these guys from that honor block um, over to the tailor shop. And back, correct? Correct. All right, and then the last one, of course, is the infamous Joyce Mitchell. Um, you know, what's her story? Oh, Joyce Mitchell, where do you start? 
<laughs> she um she went to work for corrections in 2008 right off the bat um she probably went her first couple of years un, unnoticed unscathed and then she started in with the simple stuff bringing in brownies bringing in cookies bringing in packaged candy um the occasional recipe um and unfortunately when any kind of a staff member does that and shares that with the inmate population they've pretty much labeled themselves as that individual who's not going to do what they're supposed to be doing is a bit of a rebel uh, going to do it their way um, understand these people are very well trained and this is a huge uh, no no uh, this is something that you're not supposed to be doing uh, she's sharing personal information with them she was verbally counseled a number of times by her uh, superiors. She she just she would be all right for a short period of time, and then she'd go right back to the behavior and escalate. It got to the point that uh, by 2012, she was actually formally counseled, and in turn, Joyce Mitchell files a grievance. My my administrators are picking on me. So starting in 2013, her supervisors are now doing yearly evaluations and saying that she's a substandard employee, that she needs work in particular items. Um, and from 2013 right up through 14 and into the early part of 15, it completely comes off the rails. So yeah. she, she had an established history already of um, crossing the line, correct? Absolutely correct. Now, let me ask a question, because I know this is where we're going to start getting the interaction, because we're going to start talking about the manipulation and obviously what led to the escape. But did she only cross the line with David Sweat and Richard Matt, or did she have a history of doing that with other inmates? She was bringing in these brownies and cookies and packaged candies and new recipes that stuff was being passed around the entire shop for the most part um she had this infatuation with sweat um to the point where she was draping her arm around him totally inappropriate in the correctional setting uh discussing personal information with him again totally unacceptable behavior from a staff member um so you know she was doing dirty with a lot of the inmates in that area but um without a doubt sweat was um uh, her main focus hey gary let me ask you a question gary from your experience what do you think it was about joyce that david and obviously eventually richard matt decide to hone in on her well number one you know we always talk about inmate manipulation but from from what I've just heard from Charles, who was who would know more about it than many people, probably knows more about it than many of the people who produced that show. And then you take the Inspector General's report, and then you take the way they made the show. From what I'm seeing with Joyce Mitchell, I don't think it would take much manipulation. She seemed to have her own agenda going in from what they're saying. Uh, so when she started bringing in this food and these brownies, you know, we all know the inmates are boom. They're, they're zoomed in on her and, uh, uh, sweat and Matt probably knew right away that if they wanted to be up to no good, she would be a very easy, easy target because she's going to go along with them. So I, I see her as also a control person. You know, she can go home at night with her husband knowing that she can control uh, sweeten them and, and have them f all for her when she got back to work the next day. And there's some women that are like that. I've interviewed women like that. I've asked women, why did you have a relationship, you know, at the end of the investigation with this inmate? And the answer was, um, I wanted, I love being told I was beautiful. I love being told how, how uh, great I am. And I love the control of knowing that when I went home tonight, they can't be out with anybody else but me. She kind of gives me that 
feeling, you know, of being that type of a woman. And you know what? What's weird about this all? We all, obviously we look back. We know this could have been prevented, but it's not. This is not that hindsight bias. This is not that Monday Night Quarterback. And this is signs that were available then that obviously was overlooked. And I want to talk about the environment that Joyce was in that allowed for this to happen. Because you could have targets that are soft targets and easy to manipulate, but if they're put in an environment where staff is doing what they're supposed to be doing it makes it harder for the inmate to employ the game because the fail safes are in play. Here, the fail safes weren't in play. The environment was very complacent, very lax. So right there, you get Joyce doing these things. And the first thing we're thinking of from a custody level is what the hell are the officers doing? So Charles, this environment was extremely complacent and how much, I mean, because of that complacency, how much did the environment take part in that manipulation of Joyce Mitchell. Well, understand, Anthony, with Joyce Mitchell, she had been verbally counseled. She had been formally counseled. Then she had been um, gigged on her yearly evaluations. Joyce Mitchell, in turn, took those different mechanisms and turned them back on the administrators that were implementing them on her, and she filed grievances against them. What happened at that point in time was, as a result of that grievance procedure, Joyce Mitchell felt empowered. She would actually come back to the tailor shop area where she worked with a smug on her, you know, smug, shit-eating grin on her face, uh, empowered that you can't touch me and I'm going to continue to do it my way. The officer that was assigned that particular post, starting as of January of uh, 2015, the kids trying to survive the experience and trying to get the heck out of that particular job because Joyce Mitchell was right off the rails. This kid is trying to get out of there because she's just running this, this tailor shop like an animal house. Um, he's trying to survive the experience because he can see right now that the administration is, is, is having no effect with her. Uh, she's she's a rogue employee, I guess is the best way to describe her. And her her behaviors escalated to the point where uh, we ended up with, of course, the mess that we ended up with. But the officer was trying to survive the experience. Uh, right, but when I mean when I mean the complacency, I'm talking about the bringing back and forth of sweat and mat. Because remember, we're talking about the travel of contraband. Because obviously contraband winds up making its way back to the honor block and we're focusing again on Eugene Palmer, um, you know, not bringing these inmates through the metal detectors or whatever the case may be. So obviously I'm also talking about the contraband going back to the honor block. But but I just want to back up for a second though here too, because I understand where you're coming from too as well. Who first reported her uh, first incidences with um, this undue relationship or this unprofessionalism? Basically, um, there was a letter to the uh, administration um, that was an anonymous letter sent to the administration saying that there was a uh, some sort of a relationship going on between inmate Sweat and Joyce Mitchell. That was investigated and found to be unfounded. Now, you'll see that the IG report does discuss that, and it also discussed the fact that the investigation was flawed. Um, that they didn't um, go and do a self risk on inmate Matt or uh, excuse me, inmate uh, sweat cell. Uh, that there was a lot of shortcomings there as a result of that investigation. Um, it, it, it's, realistically, it's basic corrections 101. If you've got allegations, uh, staff uh, and an inmate inappropriate relationship, first thing you're doing is you go to the staff member. You're going to get a memo from them with regards to what's your take on this. And at the same time that that's being generated, you are having someone frisk that inmate cell. It, it, it's real simple. Corrections 101. That right. didn't happen in this particular case uh, by the investigators. And, and without a doubt, had they done that, you would have discovered the, uh, the escape in the very early stages, needless to say. Right. And, and, and Gary, just as an inspector's perspective, what's the difference between unfounded, unsubstantiated, and substantiated so the audience can get an understanding of the outcome? Well, a substantiated uh, investigation means 
that the allegations were proven. The allegations made against the staff member are proven to be true. Uh, unsubstantiated means they can prove the case and unfounded, not enough evidence. But I do want to tell you, um, and, and Charles is right, this entire incident uh, could have been stopped way before it ever got to the point of the escape. Now, I would do uh, just a little different than what Charles mentioned. Uh, I've done many staff inmate relationships, so I have the allegation assigned to me. Now, I am not a New York inspector. If they did what I'm about to say, then that's good. Something tells me they did not do these following things, though. And I'm not saying I'm better than Inspector General of New York because I'm in Florida. I'm saying these are what they should have done. They can answer if they want to on if they did these following things. I always like to leave the suspect or subject till last. So I would have left Joyce Mitchell for last, for my last interview. What I would have done is started monitoring uh, the inmates' phone calls, Sweet and Matt. May not have gotten anything, but I would monitor and record their phone calls, the ones that I wanted to keep. I would tell the mail room, I want all the mail coming from Matt and Sweet to be uh, photocopied. Go ahead and send the original mail to them so they don't know anything's going on, but I want all their mail, you know, so I can read their mail. Now, that's two things that I can look at. The other thing is, I would go before I went to Joyce Mitchell, and if all else fails and I get nothing from the mail and I get nothing from the phone calls, I go to the cells of the inmates. And as an inspector, I would get a couple of officers and they would go with me. And we would take both the inmates out and separate them. We would search the inmates, of course, when we got them out of the cell, and Matt would go to one area for an interview and with an officer. He would stay with an officer to be watched. Sweet would go to another one. And we would go through the property of both these inmates. Now, Charles, if you disagree when I'm done, let me know. But I believe had that been done and they thoroughly combed both of those cells, inch by inch, I think you would have found something connecting them to Joyce Mitchell, it may not have been enough for criminal, but it may have been enough for administrative uh, 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 discipline that could have prevented this from happening. Um, and also, there is another method that we used if all else failed. We would go to the state attorney because we aren't having allegations of uh, inappropriate relations, allegations of contraband. We can get the state attorney to give us a subpoena for Joyce Mitchell's phone records. I've done that a lot, and we've actually connected with male officers in a female prison or female officers in a male prison where they've contacted a relative of the inmate. And if you remember Joyce Mitchell in the show, and Charles, I don't know if that's true or not, if that was a misconception, she contacted uh, Matt's daughter in the show. And I'll let you tell us if that, if, if you know if that really happened or not. Absolutely. And, and understand, and let's get the timeline here. The escape takes place June of 15. July of 14 is when the uh, Clinton Correctional Facility receives that letter of inappropriate behavior. So July of 14. They did not get this. Did they have these allegations before the escape? Absolutely. In July of 2014, 11 months prior to the escape, the Clinton Correctional Facility Administration, 11 months prior, receives this letter of inappropriate conduct in Taylor Shop Number 1, where Joyce Mitchell is. A month later, in August of 14, Joyce Mitchell smuggles in her first pair, or uh, I'll call it the first item of true. Uh, contraband with regards to the escape. Joyce Mitchell purchases for less than $10 from Amazon two pairs of lighted glasses. So th that's our first real, we've moved out of the realm of McDonald's, Big Macs, we've moved out of uh, hard candies, we've moved out of uh, baked treats, 
Now she's actually purchased two pairs of lighted reading glasses. In, and that's August of 14, as well as some exercise gloves. Month later, September 14, David Sweat has now been removed from um, Taylor Shop number one. The uh, Clinton Correctional Facility Administration got a second bite at the apple. Um, Sweat got into a verbal confrontation with Joyce Mitchell's supervisor with regards to a screw up on uh, ordering some zippers as crazy as it sounds for uh, the tailor shop and and sweat interjects his opinion with regards to the order was screwed up by the civilian da 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 and the administration finally had what they wanted um they're going to separate this inmate from staff uh, they, they didn't have enough to prove the allegations but they felt something was amiss um, this gave them the window that, of opportunity that they needed david sweat is now gone in september of 14. This is when Richard Matt steps up to the plate, the master of manipulation. And now Joyce Mitchell is making phone calls to Richard Matt's daughter. Something that Richard Matt is capable of doing himself. But now Joyce Mitchell is making those phone calls on his behalf. Not only is she making phone calls, but she's doing text messages with Matt's daughter as well. She also went so far as calling the wife of another inmate at Clinton Correctional Facility in September of 14. At this point in time, her husband, Lyle, says, and talks to his wife, and it's documented, that you need to stop doing this. He brings it to her attention. You're, you're way out of bounds, and, and you need to stop the behavior. How did he, how, hey, 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 Charles, how did he find out she was doing it? They live in the same house. <laughs> she saw the, he saw the phone, he saw... I, I, yeah, it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's not like they're living in a, in a huge house. You know? Yeah, but see, the thing is, my, my concern is, because this was never mentioned in the Showtime thing, he saw her, hey, 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 guy, real quick, wouldn't he be responsible to report that? Yes, and of course, we, we all know that's his wife, and we know he's probably not going to do it, but... He is responsible. He's an employee at the prison, and he has to follow every policy that everyone else does. Didn't Showtime make it look like that Lyle knew nothing? Showtime made it look like Lyle knew nothing of any type of undue relationship, and obviously texting is undue or phone calls. Absolutely. Showtime made it look as if he was suspicious of everything, but they never really pinpointed in the show that he knew things especially that, that's a big thing because that, that's in the book the phone you know that's a big thing because that that obviously would make me look at lyle a little different now i felt sorry for lyle because i saw a guy that just wasn't in the know trusted his wife it was even shocked when you know this issue came to light but to be honest with you there she, she is making phone calls on these inmates behalf and texting now I'm thinking that Lyle was in the know the whole time. Charles, he was actually, did anybody question him about that? You know, how Lyle got through this unscathed is absolutely beyond me, Anthony. Um, and the reason why I say that is, again, we, we got up as far as September of 2014. Beginning in October of uh, 2014, right up until the date of the escape, up into June of 15, Joyce Mitchell started to smuggle in a tremendous amount of contraband. Starting in October of 2014, Joyce Mitchell was able to smuggle in over 70 containers of black and cayenne pepper. She would take and purchase the black or cayenne pepper. She would remove it from its original packaging. The key there is removing it from the original packaging because it, it contains that foil tamper seal, which would set off a metal detector. She would smuggle the uh, black and cayenne pepper in a, in a glad type bag type of scenario into the facilities. Also, almost on a daily basis, understand sweat has been removed from her tailor shop now since September. She was sending love notes back and forth almost on a daily basis via inmate Matt. She was also smuggling into Clinton Correctional Facility liquor to inmate Matt. Bacardi 151, wild turkey bourbon, um, as well as uh, contraband food. 
as well as envelopes that were supposedly containing paints and brushes. Um, a lot of gray area there with regards to what exactly was in the envelopes. No gray area with regards to the, the introduction of the prison contraband, but there was a lot of concerns with supposedly, you know, during the interviews, Joyce Mitchell was advising them that it was paint and brushes, but you know, it could have been just about anything. Hey, Charles, let me ask a question though. Um, how did she get the liquor bottles and stuff in though? Um, she was bringing the liquor in um, like a Pepsi bottle type of a scenario. Uh, Pre-mixed, so she was putting the Bacardi 151 or the or the uh, wild turkey bourbon uh, into a, a mix with a uh, with a, a, a Coca-Cola or Pepsi uh, type product bottle. And is that permissible, like the Pepsi itself? Yes, you know, a civilian could bring in uh, a non-alcoholic beverage absolutely into the uh, facility. For, for the, some, for most facilities. What they do is, if they allow a drink, technically it's usually clear water because you can see through it. It has to also be uh, sealed. Um, you know, and then the water, because it's clear and then obviously sealed so you know it hasn't been tampered with. So something like that, especially in my state, would never be allowed in because of the, uh, first off, it's Pepsi, you can't see it, and it was unsealed. It was like you can't, if you're drinking it before you go through that metal detector, you either got to finish it or throw it out. Okay. Yeah, you know. New York State, no. No, if they went in there with a liter bottle of Pepsi, they had a, it, it would have been a, would have been allowed. And, but, and you know what? Staff member, no. Staff yeah, member. No, yeah, but we, I mean, we would do for civilian or um, yeah. It's it just it's you know it's it's secure it's mm -hmm. you know again it's it's the evolution. We all you know once something happens once, you try not to get burned twice. So I'm not maybe there was net, no no reason to stop it prior, but I'm mm -hmm. sure at this point. Hopefully the security measures will change. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not here to I'm not here to point blame. Just try to share a story. But I want to mention something from the administrative level and see if you guys agree. An inmate to me can easily be replaced. So the moment, even if you get this allegation, it, it's a job. Uh, remove the inmate. You know, they don't, job is a privilege. You know what I mean? You know, remove the inmate. You know, but but what, what what we tend to do, and I think it's a very smart move, and this is what really exposes, in my mind, the relationship, is when they do that separation, and then Mitchell loses that perceived sense of control she had. So now she has to find a way to connect, and that's where you could see she makes the effort with Matt, and in, in one case, at least the the um the what do you call it? The uh, Showtime showed it. She even crosses into talking to Palmer, you know, because at that point she's desperate for that connection. And I've seen stuff like that in my career where there's a possible relationship, but there's just not enough evidence either way. But management doesn't want to wait for that relationship to mature because of the result that contraband could, you know, come out of this. So they make an effort to move the inmate and then you find staff who's been manipulating defending their position like in this case joyce mitchell saying i need him he's my best worker listen you should never feel obligated to an inmate you should never feel that you need an inmate so i think that point here is the lights are on now the lights are flashing what's going on um again with this relationship between the two and i i like even though it was delayed i do like the fact that at least eventually they got the separation, but uh, but the problem, of, obviously, of course, should have been it should have been done a lot quicker. The moment the allegations made, why not just remove the inmate? Right. You know, right. And, and 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 Gary, I, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, Gary, what do you got? Well, I just want to say, you know, as I said earlier, uh, without talking about the investigation anymore, I, I really feel strongly, it's my opinion only, that they could have. Uh, dug deeper and done a better investigation, I think they would have got her. But as what you just said also, I, I, I really love that you said that because as a prison inspector in Florida, we had the power to move an inmate anytime we wanted to if we had an assigned investigation with allegations. So even if I had that case with Joyce Mitchell and I found nothing, but you know, you have that gut feeling, I may not have found any evidence, but I feel something's wrong. We would we could transfer the inmate to another prison. We have plenty of prisons, just like and, and New York has plenty of prisons. Transfer the inmate out of there and get him out of there. If she's going to start another relationship with another inmate, we'll catch her down the road. But I agree 100%. At least at a minimum, get the inmate out of that prison. And Garrett, you know, again, 
um, this being key, even administratively, we would actually, if we felt there was, here's where it gets complicated, actually. Um, actually, it does. Because administratively, we may want to put a nip to it, um, separate them. But investigative-wise, you may want to see what this relationship is doing. So you may want them to remain together. So you think there's a chance that the inspectors wanted to see if there was an established relationship before they made an effort to separate them? Or are we jumping the gun? I, you know, I can't speak for the New York inspectors. I think if you work hard at that case, you can solve that case before the escape. But that's a possibility. What you just said is a possibility. They could have walked out of there and said, we can't get her this time, but if something's happening, we'll get her down the road. So you're right. That could be a possibility. But the only thing is, and the reason why I'm kind of thinking, something from the administrative level is if they wanted that to do it kind of, let's have this investigation going on to see if there is a, a relationship, they wouldn't have written her up. Right. And also... Um, they kind of gave her the heads up when they wrote her up saying, hey, we think this is happening and then they write her up. Well, when they wrote her up, I thought to myself, well, an administration must have thought, okay, we wrote her up, so now she's warned she's going to stop, you know. But unfortunately, in cases like hers and many others that have happened in, across the country, they just don't stop. They now, just hey, Charles, what, Charles, what was she written up for the first time? Um, her behavior with the inmates, she was way too friendly with them. She was giving them way too much personal information. And, and again, they started, uh, her, her uh, administrator started with uh, verbal counseling. Uh, retraining? Retraining, you know, yeah, just the basics. Um, right, now let me, ask a, let me ask a question. Did they say that she was overly involved with the inmates in general or specifically the one? Image in general, she was. She wanted to be everybody's friend. See, that's where. See, again, I know it may sound weird, guys. We know we have someone that's soft. We know that she's definitely going to be a target. But the problem is, is they're having trouble focusing on the inmate. Usually, when we look for that undue relationship, we're looking for the one, not the many. I know it sounds weird, but it's true. We're looking for the focus on the one because we're looking for the inconsistency on how she treats the one over the over the rest. So the first written grievance obviously was, and, and here's the unique thing too. I, I being an, a boss myself, when you write an employee up, and again, this is general speaking, you're going to expect the employee obviously to defend themselves. And there's certain ways that they do it. One way, if they're right, the defense is going to be easy for them. Hey, you're wrong. And I'm going to defend my position. But sometimes when they're wrong and they know they're wrong, and it's harder for them to defend it, they start attacking the person who wrote it as if you're retaliating against me for whatever it is or you're coming after me because I'm a woman or some other protective category. And it makes the higher level very hesitant, which they shouldn't, but be very hesitant and write in another charge because, again, it, 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 for some reason they feel that if I write another charge – um, it, it's going to wind up in their mind being some form of ethic violation, which it never is. But that's kind of how crazy Joyce Mitchell was able to utilize that to her benefit. Here it is, management, again, the second, you know, the first time around, uh, writing, writing her up, and then her quickly, her defense is basically, you're targeting me, you know, and then trying to push for that harassment. And so, and Charles, you said that when she did that, do you believe that slowed management down? Absolutely, it slowed man management down. And understand, <clears throat> some of the other contributing factors is understand Corecraft that she worked for is a $50 million entity with the New York State Department of Corrections. They're generating $50 million in orders on a yearly basis. The tailor shop aspect of Corecraft is a $10 million entity. New York State was in a hiring freeze mechanism at that particular point in time. So thus, you had a $10 million business, Corecraft. You had a hiring freeze that you couldn't replace Joyce Mitchell. So it almost appears, as far as I was concerned, that Corecraft would rather have a 
substandard employee, then no employee at all. Combine that with um, the, the letter to the, the anonymous letter in September uh, announcing what appears to be an inappropriate relationship, thus the investigation, um, all contributes, you know, and then the resulting uh, uh, retaliatory strike from Joyce Mitchell. Yeah, you got yourself quite a quagmire there. Um, you, you really do. And, and that's why your officer that's working that area is trying to get out because it's a mess. Uh, administration is trying to figure out how do we deal with this individual because it's a mess. And, 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 got, and, and it's funny, Charles, because again, Gary, just in, in your opinion, could there have been a conflict between the way administrators, administration wanted to handle it and the investigators? Yeah, here's what gets me. Um, we have a legal team in Tallahassee. Civilian employees in Florida are, are the easiest to terminate. Of course, you know, officers are, are have more uh, things. We're, they're very easy here to terminate. Under, under Florida statute 947.44, Food is a felony. You bring food into a prison, that's a felony. So I don't know what it is in New York, but just her bringing in food to the inmates would have been enough for us to get rid of her. I don't know what they do up there. And it's a shame that they could not have used one of these uh, issues that they had to, to, to send her out the door. I'm a little bit of a hard ass about the companies, but that's me. I could care less about how much money those companies make and, and, I, I think the security of the prison is more important. I'm not up there, and I don't know everything that they do up there. Right, and sometimes, uh, just to give something a little bit to the audience here, sometimes administration can get wind of it and then request the investigation. Sometimes the investigation can be done privately uh, with the investigator just does it without administration knowing, but the, the findings will go back to the administrator uh, but again, the investigation could come from a source that didn't go through administration and went directly to the, um, I would say the internal affairs division, but you're, you're the inspector general's office, obviously, but I believe they changed it to like public, uh, again, comment below, but it's like public something, public standard or public. I, I think the name is changing, but either way, we're talking about the internal investigative division, the ones that investigate staff and, and, and wrongdoing with inmates or something that may leave. Uh, to the outside. Uh, it's, an, it, yeah. it's, it's pretty much the detective work uh, we would police our own. So the thing is, obviously, the investigation could have been set forth by the administration, especially if the word got to them, or the investigators could have picked it up themselves. But at the end of the day, the investigators deliver, and I believe this would work in New York, I'm sure the same in most states, a recommendation back to administration uh, based on the findings as what would be the outcome for that employee. What would What's the recommendation? Ultimately, the administration has the decision as what they need to do. Like, should we go ahead and terminate the employee? Should we ship the inmate out to another facility? So the thing is, is, is my concern. Again, it's just, you know, feel free to comment. I'm wondering what, from that initial write-up, the allegation, the, very, the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm sweating the first one right now is because that's the beginning. That's where we could have nipped it in the bud. The first one is, is the most important one. So the results of that investigation, I'm wondering what the recommendation was from the investigator back to administration and if administration went with the recommendation or if the recommendation just said it's, see, there is a difference, Gareth, I may, at least in Jersey, I don't know, but the outcome between unsubstantiated and unfounded are extremely different. Unsubstantiated is there's not enough evidence. It can go either way. Um, but the person's not in the clear, really. But there's just not enough evidence. Unfounded pretty much clears that person. So if the investigative authorities came out and said, hey, this investigation was unfounded, administration would really have no reason to do anything. But if the investigation came out unsubstantiated, I would still make the attempt saying, you know what, you're not giving me anything definitive yet because um, it could go either way. So um, the recommendation would be obviously move the inmate or, or I can't move the civilian. Con or you know what? The contract vendor could always go to a, it's a contract vendor. You know, you know what? You're not a good fit for this facility. Exactly. And Anthony, you know what you just said? I would love to see between the two investigations what the final report was that went back to management. On the first one. Yes. That is a big key. So, you know, like I said before, I still believe the inspector general could have nipped it in the butt if they would have dug deeper. Right. 
to show me that they how deep they dug before I'm going to really feel comfortable that they did a thorough job. Right, and now, now I know we're focusing a lot on Joyce, but hey, hey, hey uh, Charles, how how was Eugene Palmer played? Eugene Palmer was um, ultimately played by um, Richard Matt, inmate Matt, um, who is without a doubt a master manipulation. Eugene Palmer was told by Richard Matt that if the facility ever was taken over, if there was ever a disturbance, that um, Matt would protect Eugene Palmer, um, that he'd be there in his corner for him, uh, that he would kill any inmate who attempted to assault that officer. Um, and unfortunately, you know, Eugene Palmer, Eugene Palmer, when I did the research on him, was a hell of a prison guard in his earlier days. It wasn't until towards the end of his career that he kind of came off the rails a little bit. But this man had an unblemished career in corrections. Um, and uh, it wasn't until towards the end of his career that he kind of came off the rails a little bit. Uh, he got laxed. He got lazy. He wouldn't walk these guys through the metal detector. And it's corrections 101. And that laziness and that, that lack of doing your job, without a doubt, cost him some serious problems. But then it escalated because he thought he had himself a friendship or, or what the heck he was thinking. I have no idea. But... He started informing them of uh, self-risks. He started helping them conceal paints that he had brought in and brushes that he had brought in. Um, he had well over a dozen different paintings uh, by Matt. Um, he, he put himself into a, into a hell of a position that, without a doubt, cost him his career and uh, it got him wrapped up into this mess as well. Um, did he have any cardinal knowledge that there was an escape plot going on? Absolutely not. There's no doubt in my mind that he had no idea that there was an escape plot uh, pending. Um, but what got him was just that moving of contraband, bringing contraband in and out of the facility on, on behalf of these paintings, on behalf of Matt, um, acting as a courier on, on Matt's behalf, as well as he acted as a, an advocate for Matt and Sweat, um, ultimately getting Sweat reassigned into the tailor shop. Uh, not back into Joyce Mitchell's area. Actually, he was reassigned to the furthest uh, tailor shop from Joyce Mitchell. Um, but he got swept back into the uh, into the tailor shop uh, after the uh, the initial write up here with uh, with staff. So he got played in a lot of different angles. He was also uh, instrumental in getting um, sweat moved back upstairs to the third tier next door to Matt which really got the escape moving forward um, type of a scenario. And understand, and we discussed it in Denimora, there were two escape plots. The first one being um, this taking place in January of 15, when Sweat was down on the lower tiers, down in the flats, um, the, Joyce Mitchell smuggled in security screwdriver bits with the intention of David Sweat utilizing that smuggled tool to um, work the uh, locking mechanism on the cell door, breaching that cell door, and then they were going to work their way out into the courtyard and up and over the 30-foot uh, perimeter wall. The security screw bits, um, and it's an interesting, we discussed it in, uh, in Denimora, um, it was interesting on how he was able to give Joyce Mitchell the size of the bit. Uh, he actually, utilizing um, a putty type material, an artist putty, took it and pushed it onto the um, security head, allowed it to harden, and then um, took that imprint, uh, painted that piece of putty and put it on a piece of paper and gave Joyce Mitchell uh, an uh, identical portrait of what the security bit looked like. Um, she smuggled that out of the facility, went to a local store in, uh, over in Malone, and purchased uh, the security bits, bringing into the facility the bit closest to the uh, security screws, as well as the one largest, as well as the one smallest. Once in the facility and in the hands of David Sweat, he attempted to turn those, uh, uh, utilizing those bits, he attempted to turn them and, and breach that um, locking mechanism couldn't do it. There wasn't enough to hang on to for the torque needed. 
So a second order was placed. And again, this is all taking, taking place in January of 2015, six months uh, prior to the actual escape, um, where she smuggled in Allen Mansion. And again, the plot uh, failed. There was a fear that uh, Matt wouldn't be able to go up and over the 30-foot fence. And so they abandoned that plan and moved to plan number two, which was the subterranean tunnels. In February of uh, 2015, uh, Joyce Mitchell, after purchasing grocery items at the local Walmart store in Malone, with cash, she purchased and created a second order, purchasing six hacksaw blades at Walmart. For less than $6, the tools were purchased that created the escape at Clinton Correctional Facility. 133 days after that purchase, you had two convicted murderers running through the Adirondack Park being pursued by just shy of 2,000 law enforcement officials. You know, and, and, and it's sad because, as I said, I mean, Gary, as you're listening to him say this, I mean, you as an inspector have got to see so many ways that you could have, uh, you know, prevented that, correct? I mean, you know, especially starting with the very first uh, anonymous note. Correct. And I do, Charles, I just want to tell you something. Now, don't think these things don't happen in Florida. Don't think that for one minute. We've had the same type of cases here with the states and state relationships. So please don't think for one minute that it's different here in Florida. We've had the same uh, unfortunate incidents. We've had the same complacency. We've had the same situations. And, and it's always a shame when you see it. And unfortunately, you know, we, you need to try to nip it in the butt before it happens. And, and if you can't nip it in the butt, then we just have to run with it and, and try to solve it and try to fix it after it's over so it'll never happen again. But I just want everybody out there to know we're talking about New York, New York, New York. Hey, this happens in many places. It's happened here in Florida. I mean, we've had some bad things happen here in Florida in our prison. So um, nobody should feel um, like you know, there are loners in this. There's a lot of honest, hardworking officers in every prison. And then we get a few that like this, that mess it up for us, civilian or sometimes a uniformed officer. And you know, you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, it's also from a learning perspective, we also can't sit and hide from the truth. I mean, you, as I said, you can protect the profession when it, it deserves the protection. You know, as a, as a supervisor, I protect my employees when they deserve the protection. Uh, but when they do cross the line, you have to be able to separate yourself from, unfortunately, the people that do foolish things. Uh, and then also make sure that other people don't do foolish things. And that's why I like what we do here is because we're not pushing something under the rug and trying to hide the facts. Because at the end of the day, you're only hurting the others who, who we need to get this information out there. You know, and, and if anything, Dan Amora, the escape was like a wake up call for, in my, in my case here, when I first read the inspector general's report, I, I saw all around me uh, from the report. Again, I wasn't there. Just hear me. Out. I'm not pushing judgment on anybody, but complacency was the first thing that came up to, that came on my mind. So now to me, when an escape like this happens, it becomes a reminder to everyone that, you know, hey, be on your toes, especially if you only got a few days left. Your job is still not over. Eugene Palmer, perfect career. Towards the end, you know, he's more focused on leaving. And maybe at that point, he's thinking he's untouchable. And then he just loses his sense of self, his sense of professionalism. And it's sad, but it happens. Plus, I'll tell you something. Maybe it was the amount of time left that made him a good target for Matt, because I'm thinking if you had a guy that had such an excellent career, uh, he wouldn't present himself as a target. But something must have happened um, during those last few years or a few months, whatever, I don't know the time frame, where something about his demeanor changed maybe or something. Because you are going from someone who was held at a higher level, and now I'm telling you something. I'm not saying inmates don't try, but they go for the people that are here. You know, don't forget, they could always go for these guys, but most of the time they go for the people that are at that lower level. He, Eugene Palmer, the way uh, Charles explained it, wouldn't be an ideal target unless something changed. Maybe, 
maybe a, a life change. You know what's funny? I'll give you guys an example here when it comes to manipulation. Life changes are crazy. You can have an officer that had a perfect career and go through a sudden life change and all of a sudden the inmates find out and they have leverage. Like I don't know if Eugene Palmer had a new girlfriend all of a sudden and he wanted to impress her and maybe Matt's doing these paintings and that's a way to – I don't know Eugene Palmer, but I'm saying but these sudden life changes could – make you a target. And, and Charles, let me ask you a question. That's, and, was there anything towards the end of his uh, career that was a sudden life change? Because you're shaking your head. Yeah, there, there was. And unfortunately, you're not going to be able to use it. You're going to have to figure out how to cut it out. <clears throat> but here oh, it wait, is. You don't have to say it then. Just Can I get credit for that? Yeah, yeah, you did great. You nailed it. And, <laughs> and I'm not going to focus too much on the escape because I don't want to, you know, obviously it's the end of the book. I kind of mm -hmm. want to stay towards the manipulation aspect. I really do want people to get, um, enjoy your books. We've covered a lot here. So I don't want, mm -hmm. I want people to have a reason to read your book. Mm -hmm. I just want to do a little bit of promotion for your book. I read your book. Uh, your book is phenomenal. Uh, it's a great read. It doesn't read as a, a, a book of facts. It reads as a novel. It tells a story. You get interested in the characters. You get drawn in by the characters. And I'm using the word characters, but we know who we're talking about. And I feel that it, it gets you from the beginning to the end, even though you know the outcome. And there's stuff that it's added to the story. I won't give all that stuff away, but that is not heard anywhere else that actually adds to the interesting part of the story. So you're getting a lot more details than you did, which gives you a better understanding of how this incident occurred, you know, because you're leading people to the incident and you really spell it out as to where these turns were made. So again, bravo on this book, Dan Amore. Gary, I'll mail it out to you. Um, I, I promise you, I, I must have read that big book in the course of two days, uh, just a little late night reading. And I like how you do your chapters. They're small chapters, which for me works because it always gives me that chance to pick it up and read. And the next thing you know, you're 30 chapters in and you don't even realize it. Yeah. But I love people that write that because what usually stops me is when you get that long chapter, it's like, oh man, I, I got to get to it then. But when you have a short chapter, it's kind of more portable to me. No matter where I go, I always have a second to read five or six pages. Mm -hmm. uh, very well written. You talk about the history of the community, the town, the prisons, and it goes in line with the story so well. So you're not taken off track. It just kind of explains the context before it puts you in. I love how you explain the history of the town. Um, I believe it's a coal mining history or something. I forget, but I, it's a coal mining history, right? It's ore, iron ore. Iron ore, that's what it is. Yeah, and, and, and it goes into the details of the story, the creation of the prison, and then just kind of flows right into uh, where we're at present day or, or 2015 forward. So, Charles, it really was a pleasure having you on. Um, we'll do some editing here. Uh, I believe that your your story was well researched, very uh, informative and entertaining. And I really do hope when the book hits hits the market at the end of February, uh, people do give a, a chance to read because you haven't heard the story this way, and that's the truth. This is based on facts, and it really is definitely good for our profession because our profession can learn from this. And sometimes it takes a lot to expose the vulnerabilities, but again, we're exposing it in an effort to learn. Sometimes you have to see the Joyce Mitchells of the world as victims because as you see them as victims, you actually put responsibility to the players who employed the game and also gives us a chance to learn how that game was employed and never is it to minimize or negate their responsibility, just an effort to learn. So Charles, um, thank you. I'll put your card up. If people want to contact you, they want to buy the book. How can they go about and do this? Right now, um, the book Denimora is available anywhere that books are sold. Uh, it will, you can pre-order right now. Uh, the book will actually be uh, hitting the streets come February 26th. Um, it was um, published by um, Citadel, which is a uh, offshoot of Kensington Publishers out of New York City. So and I got your website on the card. They can also go to your website. Yeah, they can go right to my website, and they can go. Uh, they can join us on uh, Facebook. Uh, we've we've got uh, approximately a thousand photographs that we uh, are putting one out every uh, few days now. Different uh, scenes from the the northern New York uh, region during the uh, time of the escape. Uh, you can join us uh, on Twitter. Uh, you can join us on Facebook. We have a lot of different discussions. Uh, as we get closer, of course, we'll ramp that right up without a doubt.
Yeah, maybe we could also do another episode closer to the end of February as well. Uh, you know, I think that would be great too. And maybe we could discuss uh, more towards the ending. Maybe we could maybe discuss the uh, search. I'm sure there's people in my audience that would be very interested in uh, the search for the uh, two convicted uh, escapees, if you will. And now, now, Gar, always a pleasure. You know, me and you always been doing the show. Gary has a channel, True, True Prison Crime Story or True Crime Stories. Uh, true prison crime stories. I was right the first time. True prison crime story. I couldn't go two for two. Um, but again, you know, what's good here is we, we created multiple perspectives. Uh, again, what we say here, it's our experience. It, it may not apply, but it's still good to get it out there. I mean, we are talking from how we may do things in our states. But again, your state may do something differently. So it, it, don't take what we say to be universal. But Sometimes, believe it or not, you know, we can learn from each other or maybe you can comment below and say, hey, Ganji, what you said before, that's great, but our state does it this way and it helps give us more of a general knowledge. The thing about weird about corrections is that on a national level, we operate so differently and it's hard to find that consistency. I would like to see more consistency, but unfortunately, it is what it is. But I think like conversations like this, we have this dialogue. Gary's able to provide a perspective. Uh, in this case here, Charles is providing a perspective. And I'm sure Charles would be great for other shows outside the book. Uh, with Charles' experience when it comes to training, I'm ready to put you on probably next week because I want to talk about um, actual – this has been requested to me – the training that we feel all correctional officers should go through on a national level, so a curriculum that really hits home because some states have – barely any training and some states have four or five months of extensive training so where's the middle ground what training do you think uh every academy should have for our brave men and women that uh, work behind the wall and one last thing before we come to close um and i'm saving it for the end whatever we said here was not to ever bastardize the profession we all here are defenders of the profession but we're trying to get a better understanding. And at the end of the day, I'm proud of what I do. I was an officer, supervisor, whatnot. Now I'm on the administrator level, Gary inspector. My man here is training people on a great scale uh, across three levels from frontline to an administrative supervisor on, I believe it was lieutenant of training. So we love this profession, but we also embrace the vulnerabilities and effort to make people learn. So we're not going to sugarcoat it either. And sometimes if we're wrong, correct us. It, it is what it is. It's never personal. But if we sugarcoat it, we ain't going to learn anything. And we're just going to wind up getting more people hurt. Or in this case here, uh, more people will get manipulated where escapes can happen. So and that, that really bastardizes the profession. As always, guys, the show is Tear Talk. Charles, Gary, love you guys. And I'll start editing this. And I'll try to post it up tonight. Thanks, Anthony. All right, Charles. Take care, guy. Thank you, Anthony. Appreciate it. All right, man. Thank, Thank you, Gary. Care. Take care. All right.